can get started, okay? Um, so good afternoon or good evening, um, everyone. Good morning to some of you and welcome to our discussion. My name is Andy Russell. I'm one of the three co-directors of the Maintainers and I'm also the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at SUNY Polytechnic Institute. Our subject today is social care, maintaining each other. This session will focus on social care and what maintainers can learn from more formal care relationships. We will explore various dimensions of social care, such as paid and unpaid assistance for children, adults, and the elderly. We will explore how these relationships are valued and measured, or if they can be measured at all, and if the language and structures we use for this essential activity are useful or if they're obstructive. With so much maintenance activity falling outside market-based interactions, how can we classify this essential human experience of caregiving and being cared for? Our discussion today is organized by two groups. The group I'm re representing is the maintainers, and we're a global research network interested in the concepts of maintenance, infrastructure, repair, and the myriad forms of labor and expertise that sustain our human-built world. I'm a co-director of the maintainers along with Lee Vinsel and Jessica Meyerson. Now I'll turn it over to Naomi Turner from our friends from the Festival of Maintenance. Hi everyone, um, thanks very much for that um, great intro Andy. So, uh, uh, so the Festival of Maintenance is, is a UK based event. We've run uh, a couple of big festivals now over the past couple of years and our aim is really to celebrate those who maintain different parts of our world uh, and think about how they do it. So for us, this really means active recognition of the often hidden work done in repair, custodianship, stewardship, tending and caring for the things that matter. We're really excited to be collaborating with the maintainers in the States, um, especially because uh, you know, now that geography has no meaning um, and think about really what these debates mean, obviously, in the present moment in this pandemic um, and in this recovery. So just a few words on housekeeping before we get started. Um, housekeeping is a funny metaphor um, in this context. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in your Zoom control panel. We'll bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions at the end. Also, if you're not a guest speaker, we ask that you mute yourself and turn off your webcam to preserve the quality of the recording. And now I will introduce the speakers. We have three today, we're very fortunate. Our first is Stephanie Hoops, who is the National Director of United for Alice, an innovation center around asset limited income constrained employed Alice households, working with United Ways across the country to inform policy and promote positive change. Their URL is unitedforalice.org. Dr. Hoops' research has garnered both state and national media attention. She has a PhD from the London School of Economics, a master's degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a bachelor's degree from Wellesley College. In her hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, she serves on the board of Woodlawn Trustees, the Delaware Art Museum, and the Kennett Pike Association. Jamie Hale will be our second speaker. Jamie is a disabled poet, essayist, and researcher, and journalist in health and social care policy as well as chair of Lewisham Disabled People's Commission, carrying out research into the position of disabled people in the borough. As someone who manages their own care package, they've learned to become an expert in everything from employment law to HR and advice. They're passionate about funding social care based on self-determined outcomes rather than budgetary constraints. Our third speaker is Lydia Nichols. Lydia is an anthropologist whose research and writing centers on health, care, data, culture, and the places where these issues intersect. She uses creative participatory methods to develop visions of better care futures and support policy change to bring those about. She was a senior researcher at Nesta, program manager at Dot Everyone, and now consults for organizations including Health Foundation and Open Society Foundation. When not in foresight and policy, she also performs stand-up comedy and podcasts, exploring the stranger sides of science and culture. Our first speaker is Stephanie. Take it away. Great. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to share my screen, I hope. Um, and just wanted to start with, as someone who's worked on both sides of the Atlantic, I love the idea of this uh, webinar and sharing um, 
perspectives uh, from, from two important places. And uh, so thank you for including me today. Um, as Andy said, my work is around ALICE households. ALICE is an acronym for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. Um, and we developed these measures after realizing the uh, inadequacy and the outdatedness of the federal poverty level. Um, we have been doing this for the last 10 years across all 3,000 counties in the U.S. Um, and uh, you can find out more on our website, unitedforalice.org. I'm going to start with uh, who is Alice and then talk about um, Alice's connection with uh, the care industry and also uh, the maintainer world. So basically, Alice um, are households who earn above the federal poverty level but below a, a very basic budget of how housing, childcare, food, transportation, and healthcare. So the, the, the bare minimum to live and work in the modern economy. Um, and they're working in, in low wage jobs, things like cashiers, laborers, healthcare workers. And then a critical component is that they have little or no savings. So no cushion for when uh, a personal emergency happens like uh, your car uh, transmission blows or a natural disaster like a worldwide pandemic. Um, so Alice is clearly struggling right now. Um, and part of that is Alice, you know, didn't have that money for, for emergencies, but also didn't have that money to invest in their future. Uh, things like education, home ownership, a small business, retirement. So in most uh, states, and this is just an example from our, our, our recent uh, report, um, Oregon, uh, about 10 to 15 percent of households are generally in poverty. And that's most people's uh, understanding of financial hardship in, in the U.S. But in every county, there are also people who earn above that, but below that household survival budget. And it's generally another 20, 25, even 30 percent. Um, and so suddenly you're looking at a magnitude of more than double what the federal poverty level is. And that has huge implications for the stability of the economy, as well as the policies and support that's needed. Um, and this is just a, a nice visual to, to, to make this point is, if you look at the percent of households below the federal poverty level, this is your view of the US. And you see a few dark spots, um, but when you layer in Alice households, you see a, a, another whole uh, a layer of, of need and, and financial instability. So one of the key components of our ALICE measures is the household survival budget. Um, and here are some examples of the budget uh, for uh, a single adult, a, a senior um, adult, and then for a family of four. Um, so it's just the, the bare minimum. And the reason that we present you know, the full budget is because the total often seems a lot, uh, but the breakdown when you look at the actual cost for a two bedroom apartment or the thrifty food level um, uh, plan that the US Department of Agriculture has, uh, you know, the bare minimum food budget, uh, bare minimum transportation, you see each one of those items is far less than what most households at uh, actually are spending. So you see how bare uh, the budget is. And then when you compare that to what uh, folks are, are earning, such as a retail salesperson um, or the federal poverty level, you can, you can see the mismatch. Uh, just layered in here to see how far your stimulus uh, check would go, um, which most uh, Alice households received a month ago or so, um, and it wouldn't even provide enough for uh, one month of expenses for most Alice households. So uh, we've taken our, our work and, and the budget is an important side and then the other side are our, our, our jobs and uh, put it in a maintainer pyramid. Uh, and so we've looked at all the uh, jobs reported by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and divided them up as either maintainers, 
or innovators. And then within those broad categories, we have, uh, especially for the maintainers and today's discussion, we have uh, folks who work on infrastructure. Um, and then we have another category of nurturers. And I think for today's conversation, you know, these are folks who educate and care for the workforce. Um, and they are a very important part of our economy. 52% um, of those jobs in um, Maryland pay less than $20 an hour, and that's pretty typical across our states. Um, and so these jobs are critical to, to keeping our economy running and our, our, our people uh, being prosperous um, and have a huge impact uh, now with COVID-19. Um, so some of those folks are seen as essential allies and are getting uh, recognition that they weren't in the past, um, but others are um, uh, not able to work and our, our um, economy is having some glitches as a result and certainly households are struggling uh, without that income. I always think it's important to think about Alice as a person. I love the data and the statistics, but Alice is a, is, is a real person. And here are some of the top jobs in Maryland. And this is similar across the US. Um, so you can, the occupations are uh, a lot around food and um, healthcare, personal care. Um, and you can see the number of jobs. So food prep is one of the most common jobs in, in the US. And in Maryland, the median hourly wage was $10.75 an hour. So not nearly enough to support even a, a household survival budget for a single adult. Um, so uh, you can see the, the, the challenge. These are jobs that we need. These are jobs that are essential to uh, caring for our workforce, educating um, our future workforce, um, and yet they don't earn enough to, to live in the communities where they need to be working. Um, in terms of care, uh, one of the areas that we spend a lot of time uh, re researching and, and working around is childcare. Um, and you can see that the uh, cost of certain uh, child care, so family-based is, is the least expensive child care, center-based um, is uh, a little more rigorous and uh, regulated in the U.S. Um, and so compared to what a child care worker earns, um, that child care worker couldn't afford to, to send their, their child to, to the place where they work. Um, that it would be 75% of their income for a family-based and over 100% of their income for a center-based. So, um, you know, looking in, in specifically what's, what's happening today uh, around the pandemic, a lot of these care providers uh, were struggling before the pandemic. Um, and as I mentioned, we look a lot at um, child care providers, but there's also uh, senior care, uh, care for um, folks with disabilities, and then all the uh, personal care and health care um, operations uh, across the U.S. Um, so many of them were having challenges before the pandemic, uh, certainly places that are, are, have certain regulations and require uh, a high number of um, providers to uh, uh, care children or seniors. Um, that makes it that expensive. Um, Quality is expensive, uh, more people uh, increase costs, um, and then there have been uh, recent increases in rents and facilities. So some childcare centers uh, had closed um, before the pandemic, and so vulnerable be before the start. Then we experienced uh, the coronavirus, and a lot of these places had to close or are now slightly reopening at a much reduced capacity. So limiting their ability to um, provide care and also limit their ability to bring back um, Alice workers um, that are also needed. So further impacting their families. Um, so we're seeing a number of facilities closed. Um, and one, uh, <coughs> group of care providers that I really want to highlight 
are um, senior living facilities. Um, seniors are probably the most vulnerable group to COVID-19 um, and require extensive amounts of care when living in group um, quarters. Many of these folks are, are Alice workers paid you know, very minimal uh, wages and yet really risking their lives and their families' lives to be working. Um, many can't afford not to work. Um, and so there's a, a, a real tension in, in needing to provide the care and needing to work uh, and needing to be safe. Uh, many personal care facilities are closed, hairdressers, barbers, um, uh, you know, that kind of close contact is, is very difficult in, in COVID environment. Um, some are trying to reopen at reduced capacity, very hard to, to actually, you know, pay your bills by, by the end of the month. Um, and then we're seeing a, a, a kind of a different level around a lot of the food and healthcare, where many of these work, workers are seen as essential, um, and yet the way that they deliver uh, their services have had to be shifted as well. Um, so those are uh, my main uh, talking points and introduce this topic. Um, I'll pause here and, and turn it back to the other two presenters and hopefully we'll have some interesting discussion at the end. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, that was really, uh, that was really interesting, particularly like the segmentation of sort of innovators and maintainers. Um, I know that it's something that uh, at Festival of Maintenance, like we, sh we struggle a little bit to sort of articulate what, like, like what we mean by you know maintenance versus innovation so so it's really really helpful to have that macro level analysis um so i'm going to pass over to jamie now so um jamie's going to speak about the personal experience of uh of receiving care and um so not kind of being a carer but you know, um being a receiver of care um and sort of uh how how well how that has been in the pandemic and, and before so jamie over to you. Hi, thank you. I'm really delighted to have been invited to speak. I always am concerned about discussions like these when they take place without disabled people and always delighted when disabled people are kind of actively approached to participate in them. Um, as someone who both manages their own care plan and is, has become an expert in the sector, I'm in an interesting position where I'm both understanding the ways in which people look at analysing care financially and structurally, but also being the person that that analysis affects. Um, so I thought I'd talk from a very personal basis about my experience um, and relate it more broadly to some of the pressures affecting the sector. Um, so care as a commodity is a really complex experience to receive so i'm a severely disabled adult i live what i would consider independently with my wife in a flat with a dog um but i also have round the clock care with a team of about six people meeting my needs the funding structure i use is called a personal health budget um and it's disseminated as direct payments so with that scheme the NHS transfers the money to a prepaid card from which I pay my employees, I pay taxes, I pay payroll, etc. I have to demonstrate where the money is spent, I have to have insurers liability insurance and I live the role of a full-time manager and by full-time I mean 24 hours a day. Um, direct payments as a system offered disabled people a huge amount of independence because rather than having council commissioned carers coming into I say look after as we were able to look at how we wanted our needs met and then choose the people that were meeting them so they were set up more as a cash transfer system but are now far more overseen and tightly controlled than they used to be so when I started receiving direct payments I was 20 I was in my second year of university and I was a relatively typical wild student who had also suddenly become the manager of a team of five without ever having had a long-term job financial reconciliations, wages, timesheets, rotors, insurance, management. There wasn't any support offered to me. Um, I was entirely on my own. I made an awful lot of mistakes. I employed the wrong people, was lax with disciplinary issues and came to harm as a result. 
there was no welcome to being an employer training and there was no support in how to manage this process. So nine years later, I've employed a team for all of that time and my needs have become more significant over time. Um, but what stayed the same is the level of obscured labour in what I end up doing. I'm never off duty. Um, someone could approach me with a work problem when they're in my room turning me over at three in the morning. They can call in sick at 5 a.m. for a 7 a.m. start and I need to be awake and covering their shift and setting up an on-call system that there isn't a day off with a setup like this because my body doesn't take a day off. There's no space to snap, lose my temper, be grouchy or make an accidentally off colour joke because my life has become someone else's work environment and people are entitled to a positive work environment. When the organisation for packages like this is done by care agencies, it's a paid job with institutional support and training. But when I do it, it's something I do unpaid for about 15 hours a week. I have to ensure there's someone working at all times with someone on call to cover them. I have to navigate the needs, desires and availability of the people I employ. When something goes wrong, it's hard because that can be anything from faintly annoying to potentially life threatening. And I still have to be cool, calm, collected and professional about it. But this is a choice. My other option would be to have a commissioned care package in which an agency sent people out to me at assigned times to do the tasks they were assigned to do. If I asked them to do anything else, sorry, it's not on your care plan. I wouldn't have any choice in who these people were. I might be allowed to reject someone after a shift, but even that's kind of out of my own hands. And maintaining my body is a challenge because it does take up the full 24 hour cycle. Um, I have support with all intimate personal care, so I'm regularly having to train brand new people on how my body works and how I want them to approach this. When I invite people to a trial shift to see how things work here, I show them the most intimate parts of my personal care routine because if they can manage that, they'll manage the other demands of the work. But I have to also train them to understand what to do if I'm coughing and can't clear my chest, not to panic if I aspirate, vomit and choke, and that they're happy with the amateur photography of assessing my pressure sores. So I have to manage these people as people. As well as the body that they're responsible for maintaining, I'm the employer responsible for maintaining them. For the good employees, this is rotor and pay. It's adding the timesheets up correctly. It's making sure people feel appreciated and valued when I can't give them a pay rise. I can't give them any kind of structural improvement because I don't have the funding or the capacity for that. When it goes badly, I'm doing disciplinary meetings, performance improvement plans, management for the same people that I'm relying on to keep my body alive. I don't have funding for sick pay. People then end up choosing whether to come into work sick and potentially infecting me with something that could be life threatening or whether to not come into work and not get paid. There are a lot of downsides of this system, management, responsibility, risk. If two people go off sick at once and no one can cover, that's on me. The stress of maintaining a staff team is on me. Recruitment, assessing the applications, balancing experience over skill, over commitment, trying to persuade people to take on shifts they don't want and hoping they'll do it with grace. Because maintaining a care package like this isn't easy. Anyone who's looked at care work knows it's not easy. Anyone who looks at the work the people I employ do can see it's not easy. I explained that most of the time them and I are working as colleagues. We've got the common goal of keeping me going and that that requires work and effort from both of us and the good people rise to that. We develop a sense of teamwork, camaraderie, general positivity. We can go from waking me up to me being fully dressed with my physio done and having exchanged five words because we know each other. And that's what I need in my life. People that enable me to live the life I'm trying to live. Because without a care package like this, I wouldn't be working. Um, I wouldn't be giving talks, doing my acting training, writing on a significant television show, sell out theatre piece, arts journalism job. All of these things came out of me having enough care to meet my basic needs finally. That was what gave me the independence and support and the intangibles to get on with my life. I got my first full-time job from a hospital bed because that was the first time I'd had the support I needed to get a job. And this is never without a fight. You don't get a stable care plan and then keep it. 
my 24 hour care package was only approved after I was in hospital for six months with an entirely avoidable pressure sore and serious malnutrition. And then for the past five months, I've been living in fear because I've been told that it'll be cut by 60%. And that cut could force me into a care home. And I was told that about five days after my dream wedding. So I'm still waiting to see if that happens. I'm waiting to see whether I can fight it. And I guess it's because for me, having a care package is about outcomes and they're not measurables. They're work, relationship, independence, happiness. And then for commissioners, it's about balancing budgets. It's about looking at me and calculating how much cheaper I'd be in a care home than in my own home or whether it would be cheaper to have me admitted to hospital a couple of times a year for antibiotics for a pressure sore, but not have someone every night to turn me when I need it, which would work out cheaper. And sadly, it might be the occasional sore, the occasional admission. And it's a really dehumanizing process trying to turn yourself into a budget. At the moment, I'm working on a 20,000 word document detailing my specific needs, uh, breaking them down to the four areas you have to adjust for the personal health budget I have the nature of my needs how intense they are how complex they are how unpredictable they are I have to tell people about the intimate personal functions of my body people who are there to try and see if they can make those intimate personal functions quicker so I start the document with a paragraph about how great my life is and how that's because of the 24-hour care package got a photo of myself on stage at the Barbican on the sellout opening night of a solo show and showcase I put on. But there isn't a box in the care package form for that. There isn't a box on the continuing healthcare application form for, are you happy? Yes. There isn't a way of quantifying the fact that it's given me a quality of life and it's impossible to quantify independence because if you look at me and say, well, you, you don't live independently, people do everything for you, then no, I'm not independent. But for me, independence is about knowing that you're making your own decisions. I tell new employees that their job is to work as my arms and legs and do the things my arms and legs can't do. They might be supporting me in everything I do, but they're supporting me in ways that I lead and I make the choices about. I'm, I'm, filled with endless gratitude for the dedication of many of the people I employ now or have employed over the years and I resent needing to be grateful for this but I'm glad to choose to be grateful. I've made the decision that despite the quantification, the workload, the effort, the 3am management discussions when I was fast asleep, all of this, it's worth it to be living my independent working life like that that's the way I want it that's how I want to live and if only there was space in the system to look at things this way thank you thanks so much Jamie um we've spoken before but um it's just as shocking like the second time round um to hear you describe all of the things that you do um and then uh and then think about that, you know, that a care home is, uh, you know, a, a very real option uh, for your future is it is just as shocking. Um, so thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing. And I'm sure we can unpack um, some of your points around kind of measurement and what can and can't be measured, measured um, in the discussion afterwards. So thank you. Thank you very um, much. So let's pass over to uh, Lydia, who's our final speaker. Um, so uh, Lydia's going to talk a little bit about uh, measurement, I think, um, but also um, probably leave us with some uh, provocations for uh, for really kind of what care is now uh, and what care could be in the future, because it's clear that it needs to change. Um, so uh, Lydia, please take it away. Um, hi. Uh, so I'm going to try to stay under time uh, just because this was such an enormous topic. I, the last time that I spoke on uh, related issues, I went over by a long, uh, a large amount. Um, so this will probably be quite bare bones, but I'd love to get into things in the discussion. Um, so yeah, I've been working for uh, the last three or so, three and a bit years on uh, issues around data and analytics for social care. 
Um, the images in this uh, will come from the work that I did with Dot Everyone, uh, mostly because uh, a lot of photos uh, that I've taken for other projects um, cannot be shared because there is so much uh, fear in the sector in the UK um, for reasons that I will get into later. Uh, a lot of people just didn't want any photos taken of them because uh, those could be used against them um, and because quite a lot of my recent work has been online and so I haven't taken that many pictures for Zoom uh, calls. Um, but yeah, I, I want to talk about what we measure and how that uh, has become uh, what we measure and what that causes in how we develop social care uh, in the UK. Um, so uh, it's useful to remember that before the long before COVID, um, social care within uh, the UK was part of what was called a grave and systemic human rights. Uh, grave and systemic human rights violations uh, by UN special uh, rapporteur uh, in so far as how disabled people are treated in the UK. Um, the, their particular findings were not just uh, the disabled people's uh, means for living, uh, especially through budgets, had been cut, but also that they faced a continuing struggle uh, to access the things that they needed in order to live um, and that uh, nothing was made easy, um, was a quote. Uh, so how do, how, does, how do we actually understand uh, social care at the moment? Uh, the answer is uh, essentially not. Um, the, this is the conclusion of the Office for Statistics Regulations uh, series of reports on uh, social care in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, social care has been not, it is not just poorly me measured, it has been uh, systemically stripped of what measurement capacity it did have over the last 10 years. Uh, I commissioned a report uh, called uh, Better Data for Better Care about 18, well, it was finished about 18 months ago uh, with uh, Giselle Corey, who is now CEO of DataKind, um, is extraordinarily, uh, extra extraordinarily creative and skilled uh, data analyst. Um, we worked from the principle uh, of trying to work out what question we wanted to ask in social care uh, and to work out whether that could be asked and what if it couldn't what resources would be needed uh, in order to get there so the, the specific question was uh, what is good social care uh, and then uh, also what kind of interventions uh, impact whether social care is good um, now what we found uh, is that there wasn't just one or two missing data sets. Uh, in fact, it's more that it was easier to list what we don't know. Um, this is a list of uh, combined things that we absolutely do not know about social care uh, that is combined from both that report that I commissioned and the Office for Statistics Regulations report. Um, in uh, the UK, uh, pretty much all of our data, this is beginning to change as Scotland takes a bit more control of uh, its social care, but a lot of that effort was frozen due to COVID. So uh, exactly what point we're at is uh, complicated. I did a six month project with the government up there. Uh, and even with that contact, uh, I can tell you that it's complicated. Uh, so apologies to any Scots in the audience for continuing to use UK when the policy decisions are actually different up there. Um, Essentially, we, we get our data from local authorities, uh, which is what uh, statutory controlled care uh, is, is like, is listed here. Um, so we don't know very much about any social care that is outside of what is funded by local authorities. Um, I, if you're paying for your own care, that often isn't captured. Uh, we don't know anything about the access and the barriers to structure to statutory controlled care, which is important because the eligibility criteria are changed uh, continually. Uh, so someone may be eligible one year, change their life to fit around that, even begin to gain something like independence, happiness and acceptance, and then the eligi eligibility threshold will change. And while nothing else in their life has changed, uh, their care will be taken away. Um, individual experiences and quality of care, exactly. Um, are you happy? 
uh, is not generally asked. And if it is, it is asked, uh, what's the word, um, inconsistently uh, at different kinds of points in the, in the care system. I have interviewed a lot of care home managers um, and managers of domiciliary care. And some of the ones who are doing a fantastic job will tell you that they absolutely do ask whether uh, the people that they're working with and for are happy but that they don't necessarily always, that is something that is happening within the organization. Um, and so isn't something that is asked in a way that can be compared between two or more homes, say. Uh, oh, what's that? No, uh, have I? Yes, there we are. Um, we don't know much about long-term outcomes. Do you, do you die sooner if you get local authority care or not? Uh, you know, does it actually do harm because the process of accessing care is so stressful? Um, we, we absolutely do, don't know. Uh, and also we cannot even compare how much money is spent uh, due to uh, the fact that all of the different systems that we use to provide care don't match up. So hospital catchment areas, uh, CCGs, which for our USD boys, we organize healthcare in these clinical commissioning groups, that doesn't match up with local authorities. So we absolutely don't know what services someone is capable of getting. Uh, we don't know how much care is given by families. Uh, we don't know how much care is given by people who are doing this work based on an advert that might not have been in English that is put up uh, in a corner shop um, and, and answered by someone who has no formal qualifications in the sector. And we absolutely don't know uh, how much unmet needs is out there. Uh, so if we don't know that, uh, what can we know how to build? If we, if we don't know what is working right now, uh, what, what can we do? Uh, so I've, I've done an enormous amount of interviews and workshops uh, with people up and down uh, the country, uh, when I say the country, um, around England and Scotland uh, and Wales, I have not been to Northern Ireland, um, to work out what it is that people want. And rather tragically, I would say that this is probably uh, what sums up uh, the kind of feeling that I have encountered amongst people uh, that essentially that work of there is a desperate uh, hunger to be able to translate uh, the qualitative experience of care into something that a capitalist system will render as real or um, or tangible um, or valuable uh, and I have read uh, many excellent and very angry articles about, um, about how undervalued people feel. I have done uh, interviews with people who talk of senses of betrayal, of, uh, of mental breakdowns and self-harm uh, arising from the stress of continually having to prove uh, what you need in order to survive, uh, it, trying to take up space in a world that is uh, trying to prove you at every point that it seems to not want or need you. Um, and so this kind of quote uh, has, has very much stuck with me, um, of trying to prove that you're cheaper if you're happier, uh, because that's the only time that, uh, that the system will care. Uh, Interviewing people who provide care um, has not really proven that much more positive. Uh, this is from a series of interviews I, I've done over the last over the last couple of months with um, registered care managers, which in the UK means that you are the named person in charge of a particular chunk of um, care provision service. Um, that we have created a system uh, which is so focused on process over people um, that at almost every level individuals are given tasks that are quite literally impossible given the budgets that they have access to uh, which pressures just about every actor within that network to either to lie or to um or to misrepresent uh or um or essentially uh, to be exploited because uh, if you are going to provide a level of care that is of the quality you are willing to live up to, uh, speaking of, uh, I've spoken to quite a lot of care workers and specialist nurses who, who have quit 
the profession because they, with the resources available, they couldn't provide a level of care that they felt was ethical or in line with their moral, uh, their, their morality. Um, you either work harder than you are being paid for generally, um, or you find a loophole. Uh, there are, um, or you switch to um, solely working with the private sector and, and charge people more than local authorities will pay. Um, because uh, we, are not, we are not willing to pay what care costs uh, as, a, as a means of uh, making clear exactly how bad that is. Uh, in the UK, we spend between 22 and 28 billion uh, a year on uh, the social care that is provided through local authorities. So there is other spend on social care, but that's, that's it. Um, as many of you who are on Twitter will be aware, um, Jeff Bezos is currently making about 10 billion pounds a day. Um, so that's what wealth hoarding uh, looks like. Uh, I have a series of slides that kind of go on to what we want beyond COVID, uh, but I, I feel like that's been my 10 minutes and it's probably best to, to kind of open up to questions from that. Cool. Awesome, thanks Lydia. Um, yeah, it's quite a, it's, it's a, quite a, a shocking set of um, slides um, as ever, thank you. Um, so clearly, uh, in terms of uh, like the questions that we have lined up, um, I know we have questions from the audience as well, um, there's clearly like this tension between sort of, you know, we must, we must understand care more in order to be able to fund it better. But obviously by understanding it, then it means then we can kind of commoditize it and, um, uh, you know, make the sort of unmeasur unmeasurable measurable uh, and therefore cut it and cut it and cut it, which has certainly been the dominant ideology in the UK. Um, I imagine so with the US as well, um, but um, perhaps someone can correct me. Um, in terms of, I suppose I wanted to kick off, I, I guess, with quite a UK-based question, um, and it's a question for Lydia and um, for, for Lydia and Jamie. But I'd be interested to hear Stephanie's point of view as well. Um, the plans to combine uh, social care sort of within the NHS's remit um, has been there's attracted a lot of criticism because there is the danger of pathologising care. Um, you know, making uh, sort of, you know, day-to-day -day sort of living, uh, like, you know, an, an illness. Um, but, I mean, is there, a, is, there, is there any sort of sense that it might help us kind of understand social care a little bit, a little bit better? Or, I mean, it's a huge question. Uh, Jamie, do you want to start? So I just think where to, where to begin with this, I think, Whatever we do, the minute we make an immeasurable, measurable, we lose something about it. The minute we try and quantify something into a structure of permission and funding, if I'm sort of understanding correctly, then I think we lose, we lose the ability to define outside the specific boxes that we're building to collect data and this is why I don't think any of the existing data driven approaches can necessarily be improved and better targeted to suddenly give us what we're looking for from the perspective of disabled people and independent living because the entire service is broken at the core and an independent living service needs to begin with people's views about their life and then go on from that to define the support they need in terms of the outcomes they want and to give people the same possibilities anyone else can, could have access to that if i i was lucky enough to live abroad for a period of time and for some of that time to receive care funding because i was considered ordinarily resident in the uk and it was part of my degree and that just wouldn't be funded nowadays there'd be no chance of it um, but that allowed me to become fluent in Spanish and to get a first class honours degree, which I would not have gotten had I missed out on living in Spain and studying at university there for nine months. But how do you justify that when the rules are so tight around care package funding? Because the rules are broken. You can't 
you need to start from what people want and what they need to achieve it and believing people when they tell you that they know what they need. If, uh, that that seems like a really good point for me to maybe jump off on. Um, I, I've so I I was uh, partway through a PhD working in uh, data in hospitals uh, when I I quit to take a job looking at data in social care uh, because it 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 became so clear to me and it has been for a long time for various uh, personal and research reasons uh, what the differences are in like medicine has a status uh has a, has a hierarchy right so i for instance have two long-term conditions one has a biomarker and a genetic test that can easily be pointed at and the other one is just migraines right that's something that, that's like a, that is wrapped up in you know it's self-reported pain it's something seen as a women's issue most likely but that affects me a lot more than the genetic issue does. When I go into a doctor's appointment, it is so obvious what a doctor cares about. You know, the thing that's rare and has a really interesting kind of chemical signature, let's look at that, let's talk about that. We know about that. We know exactly what the, what the biomarkers are and what we can do to fix that. Um, the other thing is, uh, is related to my self-reporting. Uh, when you begin, as Jamie said, uh, to apply that kind of model to, to care, you immediately encounter profound problems. Uh, healthcare is about is is generally built on a model of fixing things or keeping them fixed, uh, and then kind of returning you to your to your life. Whereas social care is about is about living well with the body that you have and the the mind that you have um and sometimes and and that involves profoundly different uh methods although of course i need to sort of shout out to the fact that that healthcare model kind of isn't really working for healthcare either <laughs> um in that we know that asking people what matters in a long appointment with a doctor has an enormous impact on their you know the biomarkers of their of their various uh, specific health conditions not just their, their general well-being um there, there is definitely a case and i have seen it made uh well um it was raised by uh i can't remember his name but uh, the chair of the disabled members committee of unite uh, about nationalizing uh social care um, in such a way as to remove the postcode lottery while allowing services to be linked to local issues and local needs. Uh, and there are quite developed worked out plans uh, by, like, that have been led by disabled people on that issue. I can absolutely see the value of that, but tying it to the NHS means the Tying the two together means entrenching cultural problems that are already beginning to damage healthcare's ability to deal with the health problems of today, let alone the social problems of today. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I've got a cut. I've got maybe one more question before we hand over to the audience. Um, so, uh, kind of zooming out, zooming out, sort of to to the the sort of more macro level um, and probably relevant to Stephanie as well. Um, so in the US we have this problem where um, you know the people who are care providers uh, you know we're not maybe recognizing their conditions their working conditions and then that means that kind of um, like their conditions are, are deteriorating as a result um, and I wondered uh, Stephanie and, and Jamie and Lydia I mean, are there are there any examples of kind of where measurement of kind of where, where sort of measuring kind of what's going on has led to better outcomes? For example, um, you know, at least, uh, you know, publicizing working conditions of care workers. Maybe uh, Stephanie. Uh, that's a great question. Um, we uh, are a bit frustrated in the US right now. Um, a lot of uh, these care providers are in what we call the gig economy and have variable hours, variable schedules. Um, 
and actually uh, variable tenures at their jobs that they may work uh, in, in these positions for three, six, nine months and then switch. Um, so we have terrible data on this. Um, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is not good at collecting it. They're collecting data from an economy that was functioning three decades ago and uh, all this variation is, uh, is, is hard to capture. Um, and so I, just picking up a little bit on the previous question too is I think it's so important to ask about is the patient happy, but I think that the care is off also hugely related to is the provider happy. Um, and a lot of social care providers are low paid uh, with tough working conditions and are, you know, as, as you can see from the other side of, of the Alice presentation are struggling with things at, on, at home um, and probably have, you know, family members with uh, health care issues or other challenges. And so, uh, you know, you can't just look at this person as an employee. They, they come from a family, a household, and, and have their own constraints. And if they are low, low paid, they have even more stress and challenges to stay healthy, meet their bills, and, and other um, family responsibilities. Uh, Lydia or Jamie, um, are there any? Uh, I, I would absolutely say that um, that statistics can help. Uh, we know that uh, in, I'm very grateful to the continual work of several charities that the only reason that we have any stats on, say, the amount of unmet need that, um, that there is in the UK uh, and the work of, uh, say, for instance, the care workers charity that has done work on uh, looking at well-being amongst care workers. Um, well, that might have been NACAS, sorry. Uh, and that, that helps us get an idea of what is happening in these kind of, uh, in these economies where, yeah, I mean, similarly in the UK, uh, an enormous proportion, maybe, I cannot remember the figure, but it's one of those ones that's shocking, but if you get it wrong, it, I'll probably say it lower than it would be, but an enormous proportion of uh, people working in uh, home care environments are on zero hours contracts and a, a large proportion of those working in care homes are on zero hour contracts. Uh, it is, there is enormous turnover um, and there are um, tens of thousands of vacancies in the sector. So it is, uh, it is difficult to, to capture the experience of um, care workers. Uh, and yeah, having more visibility of that would allow us to make more um, concerted cases about what's needed. But um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I quoted that uh, OSR report, um, Ed Humperson, who's the, the Director General of um, the Statistics Regulation Authority, kind of said, if we, well, we cannot have parity of policy in the sector until we have parity of measurement. Right? There is so much that we don't know, so we can't fix. Um, and while it is absolutely true that there are things that we cannot quantify uh, within care, uh, there is a lot that could be fixed without needing to quantify that. Like if you can make sure that everyone is getting a decent standard of care, not just a basic standard of care, but something decent. Um, if you knew that people had sick pay so that they were able to go home uh, when they weren't well, that would, that would improve the kind of ineffable and unquantifiable area, like feeling of trust and safety, right? Um, so there, there are practical things that you can tick off that, improve that qualitative uh, and psychological experience that is hard to put in numbers. Uh, so so it isn't like a utopian like yeah. policy, right? It's just, it's, it's quite, it's quite basic kind of um, industrial relations. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, th there is something special about care, but I think as a society, we often say that it is special and therefore it can't be measured, therefore it can't be improved without deep philosophizing. And like, it's absolutely, absolutely true that we have a broken narrative, we have a broken system. Um, 
and uh, and some of that has been very deliberately done through media portrayals of disabled people and carers. Um, but it's not necessarily a, a magic, ineffable thing that people need to be paid better. They need to have a career structure. Um, they need to have sick pay. Uh, they need to be paid at least minimum, hopefully living and probably more uh, in terms of wage. And that that would improve that would improve how much energy and and joy people can bring to their working environment right like when you don't know whether you can feed your kids that's going to impact how you treat the people you work with day to day it's, it's yeah. not too complex yeah, of course um, i'm aware that J uh, jamie hasn't answered this question but um there are some questions from the audience um that i have not got to yet and we only have a couple of minutes um so uh, Lauren uh, Dapina Frey says, uh, thanks for sharing, Jamie. I'd love to hear more about how, how you approach your work as an advocate uh, relating to your creative and artistic projects. So, Jamie. I suppose all of my projects kind of come down to a concept of independence that I've defined for myself as the right to make bad decisions and the right to make one's own decisions. So, my my solo show was called Not Dying um, and it took a kind of tragedy narrative for the first third and then flipped it on its head into a kind of confrontational, you know, you, you enjoyed lapping up the tragedy, but what about your complicity in the way that disabled people are oppressed? Um, my work as an advocate is very much about looking at where disabled people are being underserved by systems um, and with that focus on people having access to what they need to live the life that they want to live, whether that's um, ways in which licensing can enforce access to pubs or whether it's looking at funding for social care and how that's done. But I guess that's how everything interrelates. Um, and then I'm also just one of those people with a dreadful portfolio career in which I do a bit of everything because I love it. Excellent. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, and then a final question from Ben before we wrap up. Um, so it's a question for Lydia um, about really if there's anything that gives hope on the measurement questions. Um, so, I mean, are there ways to improve the data, the feedback, um, the qualitative experience of design of systems that exist but just aren't being used? Um, like, um, kind of. Um, in the So I, I've been working with uh, the Health Foundation over the last few months uh, and Jamie was at some of the workshops um, exploring ways that the data analytics capacity of the social care sector could be improved and how to build that into ongoing funding calls from them and from others uh, and I absolutely see uh, the, the impetus to fix uh, this well this challenge uh, that perhaps comes out of uh, the horrors, the, the, the carnage um, in the social care sector uh, due to COVID. Um, I think one of the, but, but I, I'm a little uh, less likely than some maybe to take hope in the whole like, now is the time for, now is a crisis and so it's an opportunity for change because I, I just know how exhausted so many people, um, so many people are and, and so, it's, it's also a time of vulnerability. Uh, I just, I mean, I, I, I don't know about hope, but I, I see, I, I just see such interesting and brilliant discussions and, and battles happening uh, within the system. I, the, I have to assume that something will change. Um, I, I also see a growing awareness of how tied uh, well-being is to success on more kind of capitalist legible outcomes right like yeah. when when people feel good and when they feel understood uh, just about everything in their mental and physical health tends to improve um, and those are interlinked right it's not it's just that one causes the other but people are beginning to kind of I'm, I'm seeing awareness of that at every level, including within like even kind of tertiary care within um, specialist hospitals. Uh, but 
how long that will take and how hard people are going to have to continue fighting, I don't know. Um, and I just, I hope that more and more people will see this as a sector where there is a source of extraordinary creativity and skill uh, and resilience um, amongst all the people that, that work in and give and receive and exchange care. Uh, I, like I, I work with a co-op, a care co-op that does great things there that, you know, they only they measure with consent uh, from workers and from uh, the people who are receiving care services and people who exchange care. So there are completely other models of doing it. Um, and I've seen that work as well for patient organizations. So yeah, like I see that cooperative and power sharing uh, version of measurement, but there's a lot of different answers out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Right, thank you so much um, to all our speakers. So to Jamie, to Lydia, uh, and to Stephanie, uh, who I think has had to who I think has had to shoot off already. Um, but before we start, uh, before we go, uh, yeah, just to wrap up. Um, so I think for us, um, there are like real clear sort of parallels with like this idea of maintenance, um, and the things that we're learning in maintenance, and about how important it is to care for each other. Um, and sort of how that is being enacted in social care on all sorts of levels. Um, uh, but it's clear, you know, there's just so much more to cover. So um, perhaps we can revisit this in the future. Um, the recording for this um, roundtable will be posted ASAP um, and we'll be following up with a Google Doc um, for questions that we didn't get to today. Um, can I just, like, I know that we discussed earlier. Um, I really hope that we can continue these discussions in a way that can be more representative along a lot of other lines. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, include, yeah. Yeah. No, um, one that, uh, yeah, it's uh, representative in uh, lots of uh, lots of other ways, including race, uh, particularly in the UK. Obviously, um, uh, you know, we have disproportionate disadvantage. Uh, in BAME communities and we haven't been able to represent that today so uh, I do hope we can continue that uh, and, and do this better. Um, so we're at uh, so the maintainers.org and festivalofmaintenance.org.uk um, you can join our mailing list um, and connect with us on Twitter. We'd really really like to hear from you um, about things that you'd uh, like to see roundtables on in the future um, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of looking for ideas all the time. So uh, please get in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.